the mount of uh, the gods. And uh, so whatever we can trace then as being the equivalent of the Arte's uh, phone would then also be related uh, to Armageddon. And what we want to do first then is to show that the Arte's uh, phone equals Zion, Psalm 48, um, uh, is the evidence for that on my article page 212 in Psalm 48 the Arctic's uh, phone connection yields the identification of Armageddon with Zion the earthly counterpart of the heavenly dwelling of Israel's God King the opening verses of this psalm introduce its celebration of the supremacy of Yahweh the suzerain and his mountain city that's what it's celebrating God's mountain <coughs> and his, uh, his uh, city and um, my translation and division of the verses uh, uh, differs a little from the, the, the standard one and my translation it involves uh, three little triplets uh, in an row great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God there's the first uh, group of three great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and so with, with the third feature there we come to the, the city the, the Zion of course the next three the mountain of his sanctuary, paragon of peaks, joy of all the earth. So now uh, the city and the mountain are the, the connection of those is brought up by uh, identifying this location of God's enthronement as the mountain, the mountain of his sanctuary. And um, then it, we end up with uh, the, the, the third group of three, and here we have Mount Zion the heights of Zaphon and here's your yark days in Zaphon you see so we have this last line which places in apposition Zion and the yark days of phone and then concludes where it, it started back in the first line with the thought of the city city of the great king so here's a celebration of God the great king the suzerain and, and the place of his enthronement it's the city it's the mountain and of course it is uh, it is uh, 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 Zion and uh, Zion is uh, called here the uh, Yarte uh, uh, Zaphon. By the way, in that last uh, line of three, uh, most of your English translations have uh, unnecessarily throw in something uh, like uh, uh, Mount Zion is like. Is that, ooh, can someone see an English translation? Uh, uh, you'll find it in one or the other. Uh, it will say something like Zion is like the Ark de Zaphon. And so there's a comparison being drawn. It's not just a comparison, it's an identification. There's, there's no preposition there. It's just Zion, the Ark de Zaphon. And th that's what it is. All right. What so, page are you on? Psalm 48. What page in the article? No, uh, page 212 in the article. <laughs> okay. okay. The identification of our Moed is also attested uh, by passages that speak of Zion as the place of God's Moed and, the, and, and so forth. Uh, I'll skip that. W one other interesting thing, by the way, in Psalm 48 is uh, not just that you have the, <coughs> the terminology there and the equivalence uh, between the, uh, the two, uh, but the, the picture of, uh, of, of the gathering is, well, the, the Ar Armageddon gathering of Gog and Magog against uh, uh, against Zion when the kings uh, well it says God is in her citadels he has shown herself to be her fortress when the kings joined forces when they advanced together they saw her and were astounded they fled in terror trembling seized upon them there and, and, and so on uh, but there is the thought then of the gathering of the kings uh, against the, the, the fortress mountain of God uh, on Psalm 48 which ties it in completely then with Armageddon and, and uh, with uh, God well then that moves us on to the final thing which which is where we started and the main interest we have in all of this at this time which is the, the equivalency of Gog with the Arctic's up bone and thus with Armageddon and to do this then um, brings us to I guess where we were at the end of the last hour where I had you getting your Hebrew Bibles out and we were turning over to Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, to uh, establish indeed the thesis uh, that the Arctic Zaphon is uh, of great importance in the identification of God.
In the article, what we will now be uh, dealing with is dealt with on pages 213 uh, through 218 under the heading Armageddon and Magog. Following the trail of Armageddon back to Har Moed has led us to examine a set of Old Testament passages containing the phrase Yarte Safon. From the first two, Isaiah 14 and Psalm 48, it has appeared that Har Moed, Mageddon, is identifiable with Mount Zaphon slash Zion. Ezekiel 38-39 is a third such passage, and here we discover a fundamental correspondence between the Zaphon, Mageddon, and God, Magog concepts. That means that the Armageddon crisis of Revelation 16 and the other parallel passages in Revelation is to be identified with the millennium ending Gog Magog event of Revelation 20 verses 7 through 10. For the Revelation 20 passage is replete with allusions to Ezekiel 38 and 39, including along with the explicit mention of Gog and Magog, the uh, distinctive central theme of Ezekiel 38 and 39, namely the universal gathering of the world forces to destroy God's people and their catastrophic overthrow by the descent of fiery judgment from heaven. Accordingly, it is generally, okay, so uh, the connection of, of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog, with uh, Revelation 20, Gog is granted by everyone. Now we want to try to bring out this connection of that with the Parousia Armageddon Antichrist episode of Revelation 19 and 16, and thus to demonstrate this equivalency. Uh, Let's take our outlines. Now, you had two outlines. One was an outline of the book of Revelation. The other was an outline of, uh, of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And yeah, maybe let's just read a little bit, get the flavor of it. And the, the opening section, as you can see from the outline, is uh, the key section which gets recapitulated as the uh, as you move on to the next chapter or two uh, but the opening section is is on Gog's uh, advent and gathering uh, something that God orchestrates uh, and results in the siege of Zion uh, so especially the, the first uh, six verses perhaps we might uh, read so the word, <laughs> the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of uh, man set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. All right, now right away you have this connection. By the way, now, all of the names, including Magog, that are mentioned here, with the exception of uh, one, the name of Persia, uh, are all taken from the uh, list of the names of the descendants of Noah's uh, sons way back there, right after the, the, the flood. And... Uh, so you can picture them here, here's Palestine. And uh, for, the, for the rest then, we have the, the area here to the north, which would be Asia Minor. And uh, here is where Magog would be uh, lo located. And uh, as the, the armies of, of Gog are described, you, you move in a circle, you, you start here, and uh, then you, you uh, move clockwise around a big circle that provides a circumference sort of, of, of the world in which they were interested in. And so you move from the first two sites which are up here in Asia Minor, if you will, in the Ararat region. Then you move over to Persia, and then you move down into e Egypt with locations to the south and to the west, and then you move back again uh, to the Asia Minor area. So definitely this, this is the location here uh, uh, that, that is really significant and that this is where you have actually Magog located and this is what is identified as as Gog's place. Now I think I already mentioned uh, last time we were together that uh, I think that the name Gog is derived from Magog by taking the Ma and understanding it as a 
preformative, meaning place, which you would arrive at in, in Hebrew, ma is a preformative, uh, which you attach to verbs to mean the, the place of doing what the verb indicates. Or the other possibility is that the Akkadian word for land is mat, and that, that that's uh, what lies behind here. But, but by a, a popular etymologizing of Magog, the, the name Gog uh, has emerged, and, and there were some historical kings with similar sounding names uh, that uh, came from that particular area, and that might have contributed also uh, to this particular uh, play. Well, back here in Ezekiel 38, then, uh, we read, set your face against Gog, who is of the land of Magog. Now, he's further described as a, a, a prince, and I think these two terms are in opposition. So a prince, the head of Meshech and Tubal. So uh, Meshech and Tubal are, are here in, are, are, are two names that belong, again, to that area of Turkey, Asia Minor. And this is where we begin, and then we're going to come back to that area again. But it begins then with Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So set your face against him and prophesy against him. Verse 3, and you shall say, thus says Adonai Yahweh, behold, I am against you. So it's God's declaration against God, Christ addressing Antichrist, if you will. Uh, behold, I am against you, O God, prince, chief of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn you about. Now you can see the, the sovereignty of God in all of this. He, he is not overtaken by surprise. He is the one who arranges this crisis. And of course, this is a comfort uh, uh, to us in the church. This crisis is coming. But look, it is the Lord who has arranged it. He is the one who is bringing Gog up, the Antichrist, uh, to entrap the Antichrist and to destroy him. And so the Lord says, and I will turn you about, and I will put hooks in your jaws. Now, as we read through here, uh, you want to be alert to various details describing God uh, that would serve to relate him to the figure of Antichrist. Antichrist has set forth wherever, in, including in the book of Revelation, where he's set in, forth in terms of the beast imagery. Now, notice how Gog is also described here in terms of beast imagery, where God says, and I'm going to put hooks in his jaws and bring him forth and uh, you know, elsewhere in Ezekiel, the same sort of thing is picture is used to depict Egypt, when Egypt is pictured as the great the Nile monster, hmm, whom God puts hooks in his jaws and pulls him forth. So we have beast imagery. God has beast imagery, just as Antichrist in the Book of Revelation has, has beast imagery. Uh, and I will bring him forth, and all of his army, horses and horsemen, uh, arrayed in uh, full panoply of armor, all of them. A mighty host, Kahal Rav, with big shields and and, and uh, small shields, are yielding, uh, wielding the the sword, all of them. And so, here it's definitely the military imagery, and of course the the, the military imagery <coughs> that you have in Revelation 19 and 16. It's all the great day of the battle of, of the Lord, and so the, the armies uh, come. And uh, now rounding out the, the uh, uh, geographical location, the, he, he, is, he is the great king who uh, controls all of these uh, areas. We have mention of Persia, verse 5, Cush, southern Egypt, put uh, to the uh, western in Egypt with them, all of them with swords and helmets. Now back, back to the homeland again up there where Meshach and Tubal were. We have also Gomer and uh, all of its truth, Beit Togarmer. So uh, Gomer and Beit Togarmer all are located in that same Turkey Asia Minor area. And then in opposition with that, we have this term, Yakde Zephon. Mm -hmm. So we've come back to, to where God comes from and summing up with the whole thing climactically, uh, there is Yakde Zephon, the heights of Zephon, the Olympus of the gods. Uh, the, the, the mountain of, of the gods, that's where he comes from, with all of his troops, many peoples with him. And uh, verse 7, so um, be prepared and prepare your, your, uh, yourself, you and all of your armies uh, that are gathered together unto you, and it shall, uh, you shall be to them, the next word is somewhat problematic, perhaps the uh, textual one will change, would mean he would be the captain or something of that sort. 
Now, as to the time of all of this, the eschatological finality of it is indicated by a series of terms, one of which here is miyamim rabim, after many days, hmm? sort of the equivalent of yark bahari uh, tayamim, at the end of the days, after many days. Hmm? It's uh, the, the, the relatively long period of the church age, huh? after many days, huh? then the crisis comes the peace comes up uh, from the abyss God then gathers his troops to, uh, together after many days you will be visited then this other eschatological formula Ba'acharit Hashanim instead of Ba'acharit Hayamim it's that at the end of the years it's that final crisis in history you will come hmm? God eh? you, you will come there at that final point in, in history you will come unto the land that has been restored from uh, the sword now, now here's your common uh, prophetic idiom. We encountered it repeatedly in our prophecies of, of the New Covenant, where the New Covenant realities are described in terms of old Israel being regathered to the land and so on. And so here is this church community described in, in, in the, those terms, regathered from the, the sword, from among many peoples, unto my mountain, hmm? the mountains of Israel, uh, which had been desolate for a long time and uh, now they are gathered from the peoples and they are dwelling securely. So the picture then that is that, that God sees something that is ripe for the pickings. They're all uh, securely dwelling there at peace and now he's going to come upon them and uh, destroy them. And you shall come up, uh, verse 9 says, you shall come up like a storm. All right, we're looking for antichrist uh, uh, parallels in the experience of God. Um, Antichrist is one, Second Thessalonians, uh, a man of sin who has his own coming. He has his own parousia uh, e event. And uh, he has that which echoes the coming of God, the divine warrior who, who comes in judgment on the clouds of, of heaven. Uh, as in Daniel 7, the son of man figure appears as the one on the clouds of heaven, the chariots of, of uh, judgment. You will come like a storm. You will have your... Your, your storm, judgment, uh, uh, theophany. Yes, you will come like clouds. Huh? There's a, another one of those features of, of the divine theophany back in Isaiah 14. Uh, uh, he will set himself up above uh, the, the clouds uh, of, of heaven was one of the features. You will come like a cloud to cover all of the land you shall be, you with all of your armies and the many peoples who are are with you. So as you keep reading through here, point after point of connection uh, develops between Gog and, and uh, Antichrist elsewhere in, in, in Scripture. And thus says Adonai Yahweh, it shall be in that day that uh, things will come up in your heart and, and you will devise an evil plan, namely, of course, to, uh, to destroy God's people. And you will say, I will go up unto the land of uh, unwalled villages. I will go up to those who are at ease and who are dwelling securely, all of them dwelling uh, w without any uh, bars and gates, it goes on to say, and uh, to take a spoil, to take a, a, a prey, and, and um, to turn your hand upon. That, that, that expression should be of interest to some of you who did that paper where that was a key expression. Uh, uh, of uh, turning your hand upon uh, the little ones and you all were interpreting it in various ways and, and here's another place that you'd want to take account of and, um, and to just parenthetically on that point I think one thing you want to check out when you're studying that idiom to turn your hand upon, upon uh, not just that it can be used in, in cases where the general subject is one of judgment or, or one of, of a blessing but in either case it, uh, it seems always to have the idea of, of collecting or gathering. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, just factor that into your, your exegesis of that path. Uh, so, so here the thought is uh, what one of, of gathering together. Antichrist is going to scoop up. Mm -hmm. in, in his case, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the depriving God's people of, of their holding. And so you will pass your hand up, uh, upon... Uh, the, the, these desolate places who are restored upon the people who are gathered from the nations who have gotten for themselves cattle and, and goods. The next expression here, we're in the, the middle of verse 12, is, a, is an important one. Uh, uh, the people of God are described as Yosheve al Tabur Haaretz, those who are dwelling upon the navel of the earth. 
Now, that, that concept, you check it down, the navel of the earth is the center of the earth, and different kingdoms like Babylon, for example, would, would picture themselves in, in sort of a cosmic uh, map as, as being the, the center of the, the world. And that is the place, of course, where the, the god uh, would, would dwell. And, and, uh, and so here is, is another clue uh, which uh, helps us to see the, the main dynamics of what's going on in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here is Gog, and he is the one who comes from the, the, the Arctes of Phone, the, the, the pagan one, the phony one, the counterfeit one. He comes from there with all of his claims uh, that he is the proper uh, occupant of the Mount of God. And what is he attacking? Well, he's atta attacking Zion, the navel of the earth, the, the, the center of, of the world where, where the, the Lord uh, is reigning. He comes from the pseudo-Armageddon to the true Armageddon, the Antichrist to attack uh, the, the Christ who comes to the, the, the center of uh, the world. Uh, well, uh, I guess I'd better check the reading of the, the whole thing here and uh, uh, let's see what do we want to bring out in your outline then we've already moved down into the section called God's Advent and uh, if we read along we'll find then that uh, it describes God as a, as a no I guess we hadn't actually gotten beyond we, we were in the verse 13 which ends the, the, the first section all right. Now, starting with uh, with verse uh, fourteen and through sixteen, we have a recapitulation of the opening section. And here, the point I want to underscore uh, underscore is that uh, as that opening section is recapitulated as sort of a foundation on which now to move forward with the thought of, of God's judgment against God, uh, we have a repetition of some but not all of the details that had originally described uh, uh, Gog and his coming with all of his troops and all of their equipment and so on. And uh, the, the key thing that uh, is repeated, however, is the Ark Days of Fall. Let me see if I can find that for us in verses 14 through 16. So you notice the repetition. So therefore uh, prophesy, O son of man, and say to Gog, thus says Adonai Yahweh, is it not that in, the, the, in, in that day of my people Israel dwelling securely, you will know it? Yeah. And then verse 15, and you shall come from your place. Now this is the interesting thing, verse 15. To nail, nail down the connection between Gog and, and the Arctic verse 15. You shall come from your place. Namely, from the Ark Days of Bone. That's, that's God's place. And indeed, the, the word Makom, just by itself, will be used for the sight of the deity here or there. And uh, here is one who is a self-styled deity. He has his enthronement uh, place, and his place is the Ark Days of Bone. You and the many troops who are with you, this great assembly, you will come up against my people like a cloud, there's that theophany, pseudo-theophany, like a cloud covering the land. Uh, you shall be again by Aharit Hayamim at the end of the days. And, uh, okay. And, and the same thing would be found true if you jump down in your outline to chapter 39 and you looked at the recapitulation that is found in verses 1 and 2. Let's, let, let's do that. Chapter 39, 1 and 2. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and thou shalt say, Thus says Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince, chief of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you about, I will drive you along. There's that beast imagery again. And I will bring you up from, now here it is again, I will bring you up from your place, the Ark de Zaphon, and I will bring you unto the mountains of Israel, and of course the mountains of Israel are God's mountains with Zion as the mountain in the midst of it. So that's the, the simple structure of, of the battle of the day of Armageddon, the, the false claim to Armageddon coming against the, the true Lord of Armageddon. And when it happens, uh, then that chapter 39, elaborating the account of the destruction that you had back in chapter 38 already, uh, describes the, the total destruction of, uh, of the forces of, of, of God so that the, the measure of his, uh, his universal army 
becomes uh, the measure of, of his, uh, of course, uh, ultimate defeat. And uh, in the process of describing the judgment, you have that interesting sequence of four features which uh, are repeated then, in, in, uh, the weapons, death, banquet, fire, and Magog. And then the second time around, once again, the weapons, which are all burned up and so the Israelites don't have to go and cut down wood for uh, seven years, is it? And uh, they're just burning all the weapons of God. And uh, the ultimate curse uh, of uh, the corpse being devoured by the beasts of the fields is there. The, the casualties of God will be all over the place. And, and, uh, and uh, th there will be both the burial of some uh, as, uh, and uh, as a sign of their degradation and so on, but also the de devouring of, of other casualties lying unburied on, on the battlefield. And so that same sequence is uh, repeated and, uh, and uh, the time's running away from us here, but as you read through those, uh, notice the nature of them and uh, how the particulars uh, of this description of Gog's uh, judgment uh, are echoed when we uh, come to uh, the book of Revelation and the dealing not only then with Antichrist uh, uh, but also with, with Gog, obviously with Gog, uh, but my emphasis should be on, on uh, the fact that the features of Gog's judgment in Ezekiel 38 and 39 also reappear of all places here in the, the account of Armageddon and uh, so the, that's some of the solid evidence I would adduce to show that Armageddon is rooted in Ezekiel 38 and 39, just as Revelation 20, Gog and Magog, is obviously rooted there, and therefore there is this e equivalency um, between them. And especially, as I called your attention to, there is this thought of the banquet scene. That is so distinctive, huh? Uh, where the... the uh, uh, the Lord calls uh, to the beasts of the field and the, the bow, uh, birds of the heaven of all kinds come to, to, to the banquet that uh, the Lord has uh, uh, prepared for you to the, the table of, of uh, the Lord. Uh, that, that is distinctively the, the end of God. And uh, that same motif appears if you look at the end of Revelation 19 in your Antichrist parousia passage. Uh, uh, that, that's that's the end of the beast and of uh, the, the false prophet uh, and uh, the, their armies as uh, as uh, well. So in our total argument uh, now, let's, let's see what I would want to do by way of drawing these things together. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the source of Revelation 16 and 19, and we've noticed various antichrist features of Gog as we were reading through this. And uh, the, the, the banquet motif and uh, Revelation uh, in 19. So that, that uh, let me just draw the conclusion there. Huh? That, that the evidence clearly does indicate that uh, Antichrist and Gog are, are the same one. And uh, see is the basis for them. That being so, and uh, Gog coming at the, the end of the millennium and, and Antichrist being Gog, uh, millennium also comes for Antichrist, which it does, of course, on a, a millennial scheme, but not on a premillennial uh, scheme. The millennium for premills come after Antichrist, uh, but the, this evidence indicates, no, the millennium comes before Gog and, and Antichrist. So to, to show that uh, uh, our Armageddon is the end of the millennium, as we have, is to demonstrate uh, that uh, the premial view is is, uh, is not at all acceptable. Now, in what time we have left, maybe we can just return to uh, what time do we have? It's five to It's five to one. So it's it's five, five of one. Yeah. We go today until quarter after one, right? Okay. That, that's a uh, uh, comfortable cushion, maybe. Uh, with the time left. Um, I, I would return then maybe to the book of Revelation and to focus on chapters 19 and 20 a little bit. Um, I, I don't allow a lot of time for discussion or so I want to make use of this, but just by way of clarification, I, 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 I feel like I've been beating the horse to death here, but maybe it's just <coughs> obscure. 
apparently it's clear enough. Okay. <laughs> the premillennial horse is all dead and gone. That's good. <laughs> All right, we had uh, tried to show uh, as we worked through the whole book of Revelation how repeatedly we kept coming up to uh, a crisis after a long period of witness on the part of the church. And now we have emphasized the nature of that crisis in terms of it's identification as Armageddon, but also it's identification with God. And uh, that's understood. Now let's uh, look at Revelation 20, maybe, uh, in, in particular, and uh, see how what is uh, contained here fits uh, with one or another uh, view of, of the millennium. And my contention, of course, will be that the... Uh, the nature of the millennium as described in Revelation 20 is not at all one uh, that uh, is, suggests that the church in this present age is uh, the, the glory kingdom thing that was uh, prophesied in the Old Testament. That glory kingdom is something that will identify the age uh, to come. Now what you have in Revelation 20, uh, maybe we can divide it into four parts. And it, it begins uh, with a picture of the lower register, and then it moves up to the upper register. All right, we've seen lower, upper register way of treating uh, e events uh, many times in the Bible, right, from Genesis 1 on. And, uh, and here again, it starts with the, the scene on, uh, on Earth, and uh, it then takes us up to the upper register, to the intermediate state, and uh, then back down to Earth in terms of the the episode, the crisis that follows the millennium, the Gog crisis, which, which we've seen as the Antichrist crisis. And then that Gog crisis is, is followed by the great white throne uh, judgment. So the three sections of the, the long church age, viewed both from uh, the point of view of the church militant and the church triumphant, and then the Gog crisis, and then sort of the eternal state following on the great white throne. Uh, judgment. Now, as for what's happening down here on, on Earth during the uh, millennium, there is, of course, the, the act of the binding of, uh, of Satan. So he, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven having the key of the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. So we have now the motif of the, the binding of, of Satan. And of course, we understand that to describe the condition of Satan uh, during this present church age, uh, the age in, in which Revelation 11 God so honors and protects his uh, two witnesses that none can stop them uh, for the whole three and a half times of this church age during which they fulfill the, the, uh, the Great Commission. Uh, they cannot be stopped. They, they are gathering in uh, those who have been in darkness, those who have been in bondage to Satan, and uh, Christ uh, has uh, overcome. He has won the decisive uh, victory, Revelation 12, and he is on his throne, and Satan has been cast out of uh, heaven, and he suffered a great uh, defeat, and uh, now the gospel goes forth in the power of the Spirit, and, and uh, God's people are, 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 are gathered in, and, and this is what is taking place, and, and, and the limitation on, on Satan's uh, ability to interfere with the progress of the, the gospel is described in terms of a, a binding of Satan. And now the roots of that, the thought of the, the binding of, of Satan uh, by the stronger one who binds Satan, the strong man, and uh, as a result of which the stronger one is able to loose those who were, had been held captive by Satan. The roots of that are found in Isaiah 49. 
So, and I, I think we called attention to, earlier on to this particular passage, uh, but again, it's relevant very much right now. So if you look at Isaiah 49, verses 24 and 25, uh, the context is one of the coming into the Gentiles. Here's a picture of the age of the new covenant, of universalism, things where the gospel breaks forth from the confines of Israel. It goes into all the world. And uh, I beckon to the Gentiles. I will lift up my banner to the people. They will bring your sons in their arms and so on. Kings will be... So here's one of those common Isianic pictures of the, of the great ingathering of uh, Gentile believers in, into the uh, covenant community. Now, what does that involve? Well, of course, that involves plundering Satan of his holdings. And uh, so the question is asked, can plunder be taken from warriors or captives rescued from the fierce? How could this uh, be done? But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce, and I will contend with those who contend with you, and so on. So there is an account of how the Lord will break through in, in power and, and deliver uh, old warrior Satan's uh, 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 captives from him. Now that is picked up in the Gospels, and interestingly in the context where there is a controversy between Jesus and the others as to by whose power the, the, the demons are being dispossessed, the whole business of Beelzebub and his house being divided and, and, and so on. And uh, so here is a picture of Christ coming in fulfillment of Isaiah 49 there as, as the, the one who is the stronger one who contends with that fierce satanic warrior and, and is able to uh, deliver from his clutches. He is the one who casts out the, 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 the demons, all right, uh, by the power of God, not by the, the power of, of uh, Beelzebub. Now in um, Luke 11, verses 21 and 22. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoil. So there clearly is the, the very imagery of Isaiah 49. And then what is of interest to us is that, that in the other synoptic version of, of this, this idea of taking the Satan's captives from him is uh, cast in the imagery of the binding of, of, uh, of the, the strong man, uh, Satan. And so if you look with me, and let's say it could either be in Matthew or Mark, but let's look at uh, Matthew 12, 29. This same episode that then takes on the form of a binding, and which provides the parallel to Revelation 20 binding of Satan. So Matthew 12, verse 29. For again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first, here it says ties up the strong man, binds him, it's the same term. Then he can rob his house and, and so on. So the picture is definitely that of, of, the, of the power of the gospel going forth and, and gathering in uh, the elect during uh, this church age and, and it is all uh, associated with the fact that there are limitations now on Satan's power described as a binding of him and that definitely then is what we get in, in Revelation 20. That's the, the lower register situation uh, at uh, this time in history. Then it goes on, uh, he's bound for a thousand years. At the end of it he must be uh, let loose of course. The, 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 relatively long period of the church, uh, church's witness, relatively short period of, 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 of crisis. The upper register follows in verse 4. <clears throat> I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. There's the heavenly council. Uh, God and his heavenly court. Judgment. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. So here are the martyrs. Here we move from the church militant on earth to the church triumphant in, in heaven. Those who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and because they love not their own lives unto death, they are the martyrs up there in, in heaven. The ones who had been pictured back in under the fifth seal as those who were crying out for the vindication. The ones who had been pictured in Revelation 14, 13 as the ones who were uh, uh, blessed with that rest in that intermediate uh, state and so forth. And uh, now here they're being described uh, again. 
and and uh, they came to life or, or they lived and they reigned with Christ a thousand years the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended this is the first resurrection blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection now here's one of the seven beatitudes of the apocalypse blessed and holy are those who are part in the first resurrection there are seven of these beatitudes and this is the second of them uh, the beatitudes are for the, the blessed dead the, the second in the series uh, I guess it's the Revelation 14, 13 one, uh, was also a, a beatitude for the blessedness of the Christian uh, dead. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are they who have part in that. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So during this period of the church age, the, 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 the saints on, on high already are already rejoicing in a sort of royal priestly sabbatical experience with the Lord waiting for their final uh, consummation and final judgment when it comes of course they are clear and the, and the curse of the second death uh, has, has uh, no uh, power over them so and the picture now then is of, of a, a first resurrection of course implying a second resurrection and here the key question is what's the the connection between the first and second resurrections and the premillennial approach would be that uh, uh, they must be uh, of the same kind. First and second, pre mills would interpret as first and second in, in seriatim in, 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 a, in a series of, of, of similar or, or the same kind of events. <clears throat> and we're all agreed that the second resurrection is a bodily resurrection. And so the pre mills argue, well, if the second one is a bodily resurrection, then the first one must also be a bodily uh, resurrection. Now, what I try to do is to show the, the falseness of, of, of that assumption. In fact, the biblical evidence in, indicates that if the second resurrection is a bodily resurrection, the first one is not a bodily uh, resurrection. And uh, the, that thesis I developed in an article uh, back in uh, 1975. That's not so long ago, all right. And in 1975, in, in the Westminster Journal, uh, volume 37, number three, called the first resurrection. How am I doing for time? Yeah, have five minutes? No, I just about to do it. Okay. Uh, so get, get hold of, of the article and let's see if uh, I can quickly uh, sum it up. It all depends. Everything depends on the meaning of the word protos, protos in, in the Greek in, in uh, that passage, uh, which is translated first or former and which uh, is placed in contrast then with other things which are uh, new or second hmm? and uh, now what's the force of protos does it mean the first in a series of things of a similar kind no it actually means first refers to the present age new or second refers to the consummation age first describes those things that describe the, the present age of, of sickness and dying and tears hmm? and death Second, or, or new, describes the eternal state of affairs, two different ages. Uh, it, it compares to the contrast you get elsewhere and, uh, when, when first or old things are, are compared, covenants or ages, or, uh, atoms, uh, and what you're dealing with is a contrast between one stage and a second stage which differs from it completely, which is, a, uh, which, which is new and, and what is different. In uh, dealing with Revelation 20, the place to start is Revelation 21, where you get this same contrast of first things and second things, or, or old things and, and new things. And uh, in Revelation 21, it, it describes when the new heavens and the new earth comes, then all the old things pass away. See, it's the complete difference between the present age and the age to come. When the new things come, then the former things pass away. And what are the former things? Among them is death. Death belongs to this present stage. Christ will do away at last with death, and then that will introduce the new heavens and, and the, the, the new earth. Now then, uh, you see, in terms of death, you have first death, and you have second death. And uh, are, are they the, of the same kind, or are they different? Now, what is the, the first death? Well, that's bodily death, all right. But what is the second death? According to the premillennial logic, 
if it's first and second, they're, they're the same kind. If, if the first death is bodily death, the second death is bodily death, but it isn't. The second death, you can't be out of the body. You have to be in the body to experience the second death. And so there has to be a general resurrection of the wicked so that bodily they can experience what is called the second death. And so in the case of the first and second death, and the females have to recognize that they are not the same kind, but they're completely different. One is bodily and the other is not bodily. And that's the way it is with the resurrection. They are of two different kinds. And uh, so you have, uh, well, you, you have the saints and you have the wicked. And you have bodily death. And you have bodily resurrection. All right, now for the wicked, what is bodily death? First death. And uh, what's the bodily resurrection? The second death. They are raised up, but they are raised up. Uh, in order to be thrown into the lake of, of fire, and so their resurrection is no resurrection at all. <coughs> it's, it's a resurrection that throws them into the second death, and so their bodily resurrection is a, is a second death. Now then, in the case of the saints, what's the bodily resurrection? It's a resurrection, okay. It's the second one, because they've already had their first resurrection. And what's their first resurrection is their... Their bodily death is their first resurrection. Uh, that, that's a terrifically comforting thing. It, it, it adds to the whole theme that runs to the book of Revelation of the blessedness of, of the martyrs, of, of Christian death. Wonderfully pastoral thing for all, all of us. That, that, that For us to die as Christ, it doesn't deserve to be called death. It's already uh, the, the first resurrection. And uh, so you get this crisscross pattern of things and in, in terms therefore of the usage of the term protos uh, one has to conclude that, that the pre mill interpretation is not at all on, on, on the right track uh, uh, if I have a minute or two left what's left here uh, a after the present lower re uh, after the present church age has been described in terms of lower register an upper register. Now we get the crisis, and we've been talking about that uh, for two hours now. The crisis, the Gog Magog crisis, and um, it's uh, the climax. It's the climax of a whole series of passages arranged chiastically within the, the Book of Revelation, where the theme of Satan and the Beast and the false prophet uh, deceiving uh, the, the world are all set forth, and in chapters 12, 13, uh, 16, 19, and, and 20 is, is the way the chiastic series works out. The first and the last have to do with Satan in chapter 12, and chapter 20, Satan. The 13th and the 19th have to do with the beast, uh, and especially with the false prophet associated with, with him. And, uh, these have to do with the way in which they deceive the nations of the world. And uh, the deception is identified with the major theme that we've seen in connection with Gog and Antichrist is the gathering theme. Huh? After, after Satan has been bound so that uh, uh, he is no longer a able to deceive the nations, he is let loose again to deceive them all. Before Christ came, Satan is the deceiver of all the nations of the world. He has a success all over the place. During this present age, he is no longer the deceiver of the nations. He, he is bound, so he can't do that. But, and here's something that we have to take seriously, he is to be let loose again. And as of old, he will be the deceiver of the nations on a gargantuan scale so that they gather their troops from all over the world and come up against the beloved city, the camp of the saints, as it is uh, uh, here described in Ezekiel 38, 39 uh, terms. So that's the deception which Satan works through his agents, especially then through the, the uh, false prophet and the lying signs that he does to get men to worship the beast and his image and so on. And then the center of it all is the Armageddon passage in chapter 16, 
where Satan and the beast and the false prophet, all three of them are combined now to describe this deceiving of the nations, this gathering of them all in Satan's vain attempt to unthrone uh, the, the anointed of the Lord on, on Zion. And so Satan appears at the beginning and the end by himself. Now these are not separate episodes, they're all, all the same episode, but dealt with in terms of different agents. Satan at the beginning and the end, false prophet and the other one in the intermediate passage, and then all three of them together in, in the, this central one. So there is the, the, the great crisis, one in which evidently we should anticipate that the church will cease to be as a, a, an effective uh, outreach. Its, its missionary programs uh, will apparently be, be uh, cut short. The beast comes up from the abyss, Satan comes up from uh, the other pit. Chapter 11, uh, the voices of the two prophets are silenced in death. Chapter 20, the beloved city can't get out of it, it's besieged. And so that's the kind of evidence I think that we have the main evidence for how we might then anticipate the, the church has a, a, a difficult time in, in store for it, but relatively brief, all right? The Lord brings Gog up to be destroyed. And so the, the, the false parousia of the man of sin is very quickly answered. Now the Lord comes quickly to save his people. He comes uh, quickly to deliver the, the saints out of that particular crisis. And so the Lord's judgment then, the, the Lord's judgment upon the beast and Satan uh, come up out of the abyss is the way the chapter that then concludes with the, the great white throne judgment uh, scene, the, the, the Daniel uh, 7 scene once again, uh, which uh, brings us back to, to our, our opening argument uh, then that the church age uh, goes until the great white throne judgment. And when that happens, uh, then the world is destroyed, and then God's kingdom comes in glory, uh, but not before that. Uh, and uh, that's about what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Re remind me of where the cutoff point was in the uh, midterm exam so that we can go on from there, and you don't have to review what did, did we cover Hosea in, in, in the midterm? I've forgotten. Yeah. yeah. We covered Hosea in the midterm. And uh, actually then uh, beyond Hosea, we never did get into Isaiah then, there we go. And uh, so uh, we began after Hosea with Daniel, is that right? We did not. We did, we did recover Hosea. It was not the Genesis. Oh, we have a little difference of opinion here? Hosea came after the midterm. Yeah. Okay. All right, as you were then. We, you begin your review with Hosea. All right, I'm Hosea. And remember to submit your reading reports with that. The exam will be a uh, regular exam week this time. Sure. And, okay. God bless you all. If we don't see you uh, some more in the near future.